Hello, this is Graham Priest again, and this is the last of uh, the short talks we're recording on the connections between Buddhism and science. Now, uh, last lecture, last talk, I talked about the uh, Buddhist notion of emptiness, and specifically the Huayen notion, where everything depends on everything else. So emptiness, everything depends on some other things, and in the Huayen version, everything depends on all other things. That's the Buddhist bit. Now, uh, what I want to do today is to draw a rather intriguing parallel between that and a phenomenon in quantum mechanics. So what I need to do in this lecture is talk a little bit about quantum mechanics, and uh, you won't, uh, I won't, we won't actually get to the connection with Buddhism until the very end, but you need all the other stuff to see where we're going. So most of this lecture is describing for you some basic quantum mechanics, uh, and uh, in particular the quantum notion of entanglement. So let's, let's start. Um, so this is going to be the idiot's guide to quantum mechanics, so quantum mechanics 100. All right. So um, let's suppose you've got a particle uh, and you want to find out it's, where it is, its location. Now in classical dynamics, that is the dynamics of the 19th century, it has just one location. It's either here or it's here or it's here. That's it. In quantum mechanics, the situation is more complicated because until you observe exactly where the particle is, it does not have a determinate position, or so it would seem. So the location of the particle would seem to be kind of smeared out over space. Of course, when you actually measure where the particle is, you find it in one place. So um, something happens called the collapse of the wave packet. So if you look at the, the state of the particle before you observe it, it's represented by a mathematical equation which tells you that its location is smeared out over all places. And then when you make the observation, that collapses into just a unique place. Okay. So that's all rather abstract. Let me give you uh, an illustration of this, uh, which I hope will make things clearer. And what I'm going to do is uh, use uh, a thought experiment proposed by uh, the physicist Erwin Schrödinger called uh, Schrödinger's Cat, which you may be familiar with. So the setup is this. You've got a poor cat and you put it in a chamber. There also happens to be a flask of cyanide in the chamber. Now what we're going to do is we're going to shoot a particle into the uh, cyanide flask and if the particle is of, has one property, say spin upwards, then the chamber is going to explode and kill the cat. And if the particle has the other property, spin down say, the chamber is not going to explode. So uh, you arrange for uh, the particle to be shot into the uh, cyanide flask and depending whether the uh, particle is spin up or spin down the cat will be alive or dead. So you can represent the situation like this and here you'll see a little equation, well a sort of equation, uh, in front of you. So this is the state of the cat before you open the box. So on the left you will see psi this, sometimes state functions are called psi functions, uh, that's the Greek letter psi, and it's uh, in between two brackets. Now they're slightly odd brackets because normally when you put things in brackets, the brackets are symmetrical. Now for technical reasons we didn't go into, um, the left hand bracket is a straight line, the right hand bracket is an angle bracket, but nonetheless these bracket the psi. It's called a ket for reasons which we also don't need to go into. Now, the cat has two summands, two parts, right? Um, the first picture of the cat, the sort of happy looking cat, represents the state of the cat being alive. And then the other cat on the other end represents the state of the cat being dead. Okay. Um, and these two things are added together. This is why it's called a superposition, because you just add these two things. What are the 1 over root 2's doing there? Well, 
What this information tells you is the probability of finding the cat in each of those states when you open the box. So when you open the box, the wave packet collapses and you just get either the live cat or the dead cat. Well, the one over root two tells you that the probability of each is a half. So you, you cut a square one over root two, you get a half, okay? So this tells you that before the collapse, the cat is kind of smeared out between life and death. Schrodinger didn't like this, but it's a thought experiment. Um, uh, and the state of the cat, before you open this box, is this superposition of kind of half alive, half dead, to put it sort of metaphorically. And then when you open the box, the wave packet collapses, and the cat is either happy and alive or, well, dead. Okay. So, this uh, is uh, what a state function is, this is what a superposition is, uh, and this is how a state function can describe a superposition uh, and what happens when the wave packet collapses. That's the first half. Now, second half of the story, I want to talk about entanglement. So there is a strange phenomenon that you get in quantum mechanics when you have, say, two particles, but the behavior of each depends on the behavior of the other one, even though these are a long, long way apart, maybe further apart than any causal signal can travel in the time. So let's take two particles, and we suppose they're in an entangled state. So this means the state of one depends on the state of the other. Now, we then send them far, far away, maybe uh, light years away. So it takes a long time for any causal information to travel from one to the other. What entanglement means is that if you measure one particle, so its wave function collapses, the wave function of the other particle collapses at the same time, instantaneously, even though these things are much further apart than causal information can travel. So, for example, um, we might have a pair of particles entangled with respect to spin. So if this particle is spin up, this particle will be spin down. So they're entangled, they, we send them a long way away. Uh, when we measure this particle, we find it spin up. Then whenever we measure this particle, it'll be spin down, or vice versa. If we measure this one and it's spin down, this one will be spin up. That's entanglement. So this describes entanglement in sort of very general uh, qualitative terms. Let me illustrate it again um, to show you how it works a little more technically. And let's go back to Schrodinger's cat. And we're going to change it slightly. So last time we had one cat, okay? Now we got two. So let's suppose it's a tabby cat and a ginger cat. And so they're in two different chambers, each with their own cyanide capsule. Um, but we've got an entangled pair of particles this time. One goes into one chamber, one goes into the other. Uh, and let's suppose they're entangled with respect to spin. So if this one is spin up, this one is spin down, vice versa. And what triggers the release of the cyanide is spin up. So we know that uh, if one particle is spin up, then the cyanide will be released in one cat, but it won't be released in the other cat because the particle is spin down. So what we're doing is uh, essentially entangling the cats via the entangled uh, particles, which trigger the release of the cyanide. All right. So how do you represent this in terms of an equation? Well, uh, you can see this on the screen. Um, you can see the old mathematical representation of the original Schrodinger's cat. But now you can see uh, that each of the two terms, the summands, the things you're adding, uh, have uh, cats representing two cats. So if you take the first summand, okay, you've got a live tabby cat and a dead uh, ginger cat. And on the second summand, it's the other way around. Now, what this means is that the state of the two cats is entangled. 
So when the wave packet collapses, then let's suppose you get the first of those situations. That's a live tabby cat and a dead ginger cat. Whereas if it collapses the other way, then it's the other way around. But because the situation is entangled, you know that once you've opened one box and found the cat either alive or dead, you know what's going to happen when you open the other box. It's going to be the other way around. Okay? So this is entanglement. Entanglement happens when two particles uh, are so intimately connected that the, so to speak, um, the behavior of one determines or influences or, uh, well, let's just say if you know the behavior of one, you know the behavior of the other one straight away because the behavior of the two particles is entangled. So that's entanglement. Now, uh, the final bit of the story is much more straightforward. Imagine the cosmos as a whole. So this is rather big. However, in principle, you can think of it as a kind of um, represented by as a single system. It will have a single state function describing the whole damn lot. So now we've got um, not just two things, two cats, we've got a large number of particles. And the state function is going to be something which describes the state of all those particles. Now, there is reason to believe um, that uh, if you look at the state function of the cosmos, it's highly entangled. So these reasons may not be uh, conclusive, but at least they're very suggestive. Uh, the reason is roughly this, that if you look at the state of the cosmos very soon after the Big Bang, um, the kind of conditions are there which determine entanglement. So after the Big Bang, you've got enormously high density, enormously high pressure, enormously high temperature, and uh, one might expect these conditions to entangle the various particles. And as the cosmos expands, so the state function evolves, but it doesn't disentangle. So if it was entangled more or less at the start, it's going to remain entangled. All right. So supposing that's right, what you get is a picture of a highly entangled universe where uh, any particle is entangled with any other particle. That is its nature, its behavior, depends on the nature and behavior of every other particle. Now, hopefully you can see where we're going. Because when we talked about Huayen Buddhism, we had uh, a view such that the nature of every thing, every object, depends on the nature of every other object. And we're now in pretty much the same place, where in this entangled cosmos, the nature of every particle depends upon the nature of every other particle. So um, emptiness and entanglement start to look very, very similar. So uh, I showed you a picture, a graphic representation of the Neto Indra last week. Let me put it back on the screen. And let me put back uh, another graphic representation of the entangled cosmos. And you can see how similar they look. Now, as uh, I warned you last time, uh, this is much this connection between Buddhism and uh, science is much more speculative than any of the other things that we've talked about in this series of lectures. But hey, it's not a bad idea to speculate from time to time. Uh, and uh, I will I'm going to leave you with this uh, situation so you can speculate with your friends down the pub. Okay, so. Um, let me just say a few words to wind up the whole series. What we've been doing in these lectures is looking at uh, Buddhist philosophy on the one hand and um, some things in science on the other. And we've looked at a number of connections concerning God, the self, logic and now quantum mechanics. Of course, uh, there's a lot more to be said about all these things, but one can do only so much in a short series of lectures. Um, if I've been able to uh, get over some of the ideas about the possible connections between Buddhism and science, then I'm very happy. Uh, and I'm also happy to leave matters to your further reflection, reading and talking down the pub. Thank you.